An acoustic drum kit is an extremely complex piece of machinery. There are multiple components, a massive range of tone colors, a colossal dynamic range, and many different volumes that need balancing. There are resonances and rings, and lots of mechanical parts that can squeak or generate unwanted noises. Above all, it's driven, in a very literal sense, by raw human power. We're very fortunate to have with us uh, a British drummer who has uh, worked with countless uh, British artists, American artists uh, in the studio, and perhaps more notably with The Who uh, live and now with Toto, uh, Mr. Simon Phillips. The drum kit is made out of many parts, but to me, I always look at it as one instrument, like the piano. Because if I take these four toms away, this snare drum will sound different. I like to keep a very open sound. Whatever you're recording, the instrument has to sound great, because you're, you're, you're starting on the right foot there. So acoustically, the, the instrument's got to be tuned right, it's got to sound right. And there are certain things that, over time, you get to know what a microphone likes. There was a time, was there not, when, when the bass drum was uh, which became known as the kick drum in, in modern times, but the, the bass drum was almost unrecordable. It was it was considered, you know, just a, a huge nuisance in the nuisance, uh, <laughs> loud and lots of sustain. In the sixties, we found out a way to really record a bass drum. Suddenly, there was this much thicker sound distortion, which we used to our advantage, but that old bass drum wasn't cutting through. And then I don't know who first took the head off. But somebody did. I don't know who's responsible for that. But somebody figured out by taking that front head off, you could get rid of that, uh, that boom sustain and get a much more instant sound that was more recordable and more useful. Um, and that was even before I think anybody figured out about putting stuff in the bass drum. You know, so that, that, that was the... the, the Overcoats and... Uh, piano, uh, piano covers, <laughs> yes, right. all sorts of newspapers. People used to tear up newspapers and put them in the bass drum. Yes. When, when, did the, when did the idea happen to, uh, put, to, holes put, a, in? to put a hole in the, in the front here? Ah, well, I think when drummers got tired of the look of a, of a bass drum, like mm -hmm. this, and also the rattling of all these, by the time you've taken all the tension rods out, these rattle like crazy, and rather putting, than putting tape on e each one of these, it's easier to just get a head and cut it out and put it back on. But the, the head itself is quite slack, is it? Or... Uh, no, actually, my front head is actually quite tight, yes. Um, sometimes, especially live, if it's too loose, you get some feedback problems. It seems to work better a little tighter. Um, but, I, but we're still hearing this, mostly the, the sound of the of the of the head being hit, right? Not not the not the front head. Ah, you see, no, the, the, that's why I use not a true. front head. It really changes the, the 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 way the drum sounds. Basically, what's happening right now is all of the air is coming straight out. So we've lost a lot of volume. We've lost a lot of low end. We've lost a lot of high end. It's a very mid mid sounding thump at the moment, which for some music is great, but it's very undynamic and personally I find it very hard to play and a little unmusical. Um, so what I do is, there's another little technique, is as well as the dampening there, I take a paint can. What that does, it's just mass. It, again, microphone friendly. It makes a very complex sound with a lot of low end floating around. It tightens up that low end and makes it easier for this boy to, to understand. By putting this on, what that does is it brings back a little more low end, definitely more high end, and more dynamics. If 
you push here and the weight goes onto the rim, it's going to tighten the bottom head. So if I do it there, so I'm pushing against the head, then it'll also stretch the bottom head. So if, if, I, if I do this, right, that's fine, but I'll go to this head and it, see it drop down. So, now if that was a new head, it would do it even more. And I use the same uh, concept for every drum. And I tune the top and the bottom head exactly the same. As Simon said, it's important to take the same approach with the tuning of each tom so that they work well together. What did you do to what did you do tuning wise to to achieve that? I just detuned it. <laughs> just undid a couple of the bottom ones and a couple of the top ones. So it's really reverb reverberating. So the now. tension is not even around. No, the... it's not even at all. No, I've actually loosened these two off and two down the bottom. A drum is is a completely airtight container, is it? No, 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 no. It has to let air out, right there. And in fact, the amount of air you get out of there is incredible. Um, it shoots out of there. I can actually, uh, sometimes Life I'll play. be playing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of air. Um, Frank, I seem to remember uh, Alan White with Yes years ago had a, uh, a tube coming out of here uh, connect to, connected to a, a, a compressed air. And you could change the tone by oh, the yeah. amount of air going in and coming out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was quite fun.